Eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. <rire> C'est toi pour Hero. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Peak Human Podcast. Don't forget to start back at episode one and give us a review on iTunes. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Share with family and friends. All right. For this episode, I'm talking to the legend Joel Salatin, who I actually filmed with on his farm two years ago, it turns out. Amazing place. He's doing great things. We actually just finally planned the last leg of our film tour ever in January to go out to Africa with Mary and to the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. and a couple other things. So we can finally wrap this thing up. That's the Food Lies film. You can check it out at foodlies.org. Joel Salton is an American farmer, lecturer, and author. He co-owns with his family Polyface Farm in Swoop, Virginia. Featured in the New York Times bestseller Omnivore's Dilemma and award-winning documentary Food Inc., the farm services more than 5,000 families and 50 restaurants. When he's not on the road speaking, he's at home on the farm, keeping the calluses on his hands and dirt under his fingernails, mentoring young people, inspiring visitors, and promoting local regenerative food and farming systems. You're really going to like this one. We tackle all the big issues about feeding the world and destroying vegan propaganda. But what's new at Sapien at Nose to Tail? What am I doing lately? Well, we got the seasonings up for people who order boxes at nosetail.org. You can add on the seasoning blends. These things are so good. They're not packed with salt and other stuff. Not that salt is bad. You just can add your own salt so we don't waste space. We give you all the good stuff, all the fresh ground ingredients, no fillers, no sugar, nothing but good high quality herbs. It's so good. I, I make these big pots of slow cooked meat and then I can warm it up and shake on a new seasoning each day for a new kind of meal. If you get some ground lamb and you get the Thai seasoning in there, it's so good. It's crazy that Thai seasoning would be good in ground lamb, but it's crazy good. You can mix some of the dill seasoning with the sour cream and put it on top of the lamb. Oh my gosh. So get the seasonings, add them on. We're going to have a whole new website soon that will have some other products and you can order things separately without ordering a whole box of meat. But you can get all the grass-fed meat at nosetail.org from our ranch in Texas shipped to your door. We have the high omega-3, low omega-6 pork and chicken. That stuff is super popular now that everyone is starting to realize how bad these high PUFAs, high omega-6 ratios are. We have breakfast sausage with the pork. We have chicken wings, all kinds of different chicken and pork products. Unfortunately, we run out a lot. We also run out of the primal ground beef a lot because it has all the organs mixed in. Such a great product, but we have limited organs, so there's only so much that can go around. So get it while you can at nosetail.org and then sapien.org. This is our main company with Dr. Gary, where we have the medical program. We have the clinic in Woodland Hills, if you're in the LA area. We have the online program for people who want to make a significant weight loss or change in their life reverse chronic disease. We got your back. We'll help you implement the Sapien diet and lifestyle. We have health coaches. We have all the materials. We have the plan for you. We also have the tribe. If you already are doing well with the Sapien Diet and you just want some more connections, some more information, share thoughts and ideas, have the live Zoom calls with Dr. Gary and I, get the extra features, get the bonus episodes of this podcast, get the extended show notes, private members area, all that stuff, go to sapien.org, look for the tribe. And that's about it. This is how we keep the show without any ads, no outside products, no outside influence. I don't take money from anyone else. It's all just our own stuff that we believe in that we do for you. So thank you for supporting the show. Thanks for listening and enjoy this one with Joel Salton. All right, now we're going live for real. We got Joel Salton in Virginia. We got some shaky internet. We've got it solved, I think. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Brian. Thank you. Well, thank you for having us to your farm last year for the Food Lies film. We're working on it every day. We're going to get it out soon enough, and we'll show the world what you're doing. And just to let everyone know who didn't listen to the intro I gave, Joel Salton is the man. He is one of the leaders, the old school leaders in the regenerative agriculture space. And I just love everything you're doing. And I love that you got on the world's number one podcast semi-recently and got to share the world uh, your message. 
Yeah, that was a real treat. And it's had quite far reaching. I mean, I still get responses from around the world, emails and people, hey, you know, heard the podcast and it's everything you can imagine from people that think that I can join them and make a million dollars to how do I build a chicken shelter? You know, it's <laughs> all sorts of things. <laughs> Well, that's great. That's what I hope would happen. It's great that Joe Rogan has such a good reach. And I don't listen to his MMA podcasts and people can think what they want of him, but he is a worldwide, millions of people listen to it and it helps spread these good messages, people like you. Yes, yes. I was on his program about six or seven years ago and um, back before COVID when I was still traveling around the world, it was amazing. In every nook and cranny of the world, people would say, hey, you know, I heard you on Joe Rogan. It's quite profound to have that sort of reach. It's pretty cool. Well, it's great. He's giving voices to people like you, and he's had a lot of people in the nutrition space on his podcast that are going to be in the Food Lies film, like Nina Teichholz and Gary Taubes and Mark Sisson and just tons of people. So he's really doing a good job of spreading the word. And well, you're doing a good job of spreading the word, You've been doing this for years. When did you start this? And when did you start getting more well-known and getting into the public eye? When uh, I came back to the farm full-time and Teresa and I married, and you know our goal was just to be, we just wanted to farm. That was all just farm successfully. And what happened was it was successful. And it turns out that little non-wealthy. And I think that was the key for us. We, we were not wealthy. We, neither one of us came from wealthy families. And so we truly bootstrapped it. I mean, we drove a $50 car, lived in the attic on $300 a month. If we didn't grow it, we didn't eat it. We had our own uh, firewood for fuel. We lived extremely cheaply, but I wouldn't trade that for the world. We were hungry and that made us very creative. And pretty soon we were actually making money. And the idea of a young couple with no external wealth, bootstrapping, making a living on a small farm, you know, that was a story that, that resonated. This was the early, um, early 1980s, and it resonated with a lot of people. So, you know, we got a lot of media attention. Back at that time, it was primarily magazine attention. And then we got discovered by uh, Alan Nation at Stockman Grass Farmer, and he asked me to write a column for him. I started doing a column, and then I started speaking. You know, people asked me to come and speak at their ag conferences. How do you do this? And fortunately, my, all my debate and uh, drama and theater experience in school uh, paid off. Mm. With that gift of communication and honing that skill, I was able to be passable storyteller. It was a good story, and told well was even better. Mm. We gradually started occupying more space. People wanted to know more how to do it. So I started writing books, uh, wrote Pastured Poultry Profits in 1993. That was the first one that came out in 93. And then next month, of, well, number 14 will come out. Most of them, how to have a successful farm. Uh, some are broad cultural, like folks, this ain't normal. Uh, the most recent one, Beyond Labels, is about farming and nutrition with uh, Dr. Sina McCullough, a nutritionist a PhD biochemist, you know, here we are mm -hmm. in this uh, interesting space. And interestingly, I think the world interest, and I can say world, not just US, the world interest for this kind of thing, whether it's better eating, better nutrition, a self-sufficient lifestyle, a business with your family, all of those things. I just feel like sometimes we're, you know, we're on a surfboard and the wave just keeps getting bigger. So it's kind of nice. Well, this message is resonating with a lot more people, and that's great. I mean, that's the real ultimate message that we'll get to over the course of this podcast is how do we get the world to wake up to this and start doing this? And I also want to throw in, you are a great storyteller. It was so cool. After we filmed with you, we did your whole farm tour uh, with tons of families. It was so great going over your land. And then at the end, we sat down. I think it was raining a little bit and we went and we sat down on boxes of eggs and all this stuff and we just had some story time and we filmed that too. That was, that was so great. We, oh, actually, people can check that on YouTube. We did a little five-minute clip called Healing the Land and uh, check that on YouTube. You'll see some of this little story time. But I want to jump straight to the highest level then, going off of that. What do you think is the world's biggest problem we're facing? Like, what can we do to make the world better at the highest level? Uh, well, 
exactly. You don't mind starting with <laughs> the a hard good one. Question. <laughs> yeah. So um, I would say the biggest issue is inertia. Inertia works both ways. Uh, we generally think of inertia as being some, something at rest stays at rest, but it also means that something in motion wants to stay at motion. I think the inertia, I think there are two reasons for just inertia of staying in place, if you will. One is simply fear of the unknown. I don't know what to eat. I don't know what to feed my kids. I don't know where to find good food. I don't know how to cook. Just the level of ignorance due to a lack of involvement in the food and farm system, that ignorance breeds kind of fear of the unknown, which then tends to paralyze us where we're paralyzed with fear. I mean, I have customers who ask me how to make a hamburger, how to mm-hmm. boil an egg. I mean, the most rudimentary things. I mean, I just look at this. I've been in this a long time and compared to, goodness, uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, when I was had my first chickens and I was selling chickens, especially women. I'm not being sexist. I'm just telling you the way it is. Every woman knew how to cut up a chicken. I mean, you you couldn't even go to the store and buy boneless, skinless breast. If you wanted boneless, skinless breast, you bought a whole chicken, you cut out the breast, and you could use the other parts for stock and soup and casserole, Mm -hmm. and, and you use the breast for what you were doing. Gradually, you know, that fell out of favor And uh, as we exited the kitchen, and now, you know, half of our customers don't know that a chicken has bones. I mean, literally, they think we we pick boneless, skinless breasts off the boneless, skinless (laughs) breast tree somewhere in in the back 40. I think there's an inertia of just fear of, I don't know how to move. I don't know where to move. I don't know what to do. And so I just stay here in this place Mm. of paralysis. And I think the second big element, a feeling of disempowerment, that this is so big, whether you talk about climate change, nutrition, health issues, Alzheimer's, I mean, name your thing, you know, factory farming, uh, soil depletion, chemical Mm -hmm. agriculture, that it's so big, what in the world can I do to make any difference? And one of the most empowering things that I think Mm -hmm. that I tell people is wherever we are today, whatever you see is a manifestation of quadrillions and quadrillions of little daily decisions that people have made over the last century. And the the world that our grandchildren are going to inherit is going to also be a manifestation of the quadrillions of decisions that we make between now and then. And so never underestimate the strength, the cumulative effect of lots of little decisions. I mean, this spring when COVID hit, the cumulative effect of people saying, okay, I'm home, I'm going to put in a garden. I mean, it overran the seed companies. You couldn't get seed companies. It overran chicken hatcheries because everybody was getting backyard chickens. It was a, a powerful manifestation of what happens when lots of people have an aha moment and say, I'm going to make a change. It's huge. And feeling empowered, being able to know that my decisions affect the world our grandchildren are going to inherit, I think is an ultimately not only a very hopeful idea, it's also an extremely challenging and convicting idea that, well, if that is the power that I wield, then, <laughs> then uh, I want to start making good decisions. That's so great. And that's a story you don't hear in the media. I mean, this is a story that you would hear about the seeds companies running out and all this type of thing because you're in touch with that. But somehow that didn't make it to me or anyone else I know. But I mean, that's great to hear. And, and I believe it because people are making different decisions now. Yeah. Well, we have more guard, more backyard gardens and front yard gardens, more home gardens went in this spring. I think I'm right on this from what I've read, more went in than actually went in during the victory garden time of World War II, and which, of course, is, is culturally famous, mm-hmm. you know, for at that time. And all of the self-reliance, do-it-yourself uh, homestead sites just went through the roof in subscriptions and signups. Those are good things. Now, I don't know how long the tail will be, but, uh, I mean, the number of people who bake bread for the first time, the number of people who got a sprout jar for the first time, who made kimchi for the first time, all of these kind of domestic culinary arts sites and, um, you know, how to have a backyard chicken coop, those kinds of things have just exploded. 
And I think that's wonderful. So the world's biggest problem, I think, is inertia. And in other words, do mm-hmm. something, even if it's the wrong thing. You know, start, do something, move, get off the bleachers, get in the game. Mm-hmm. And number two is empowerment, that feeling, absolutely feeling deep down, I can change this game. I can absolutely change this game. Uh, I can change the trajectory of our culture, our country, of our world, and millions of people like me, we're going to change that trajectory. And inertia empowerment, those are the two things. I love that. Well, I love breaking it down and thinking about things in the highest level and then going down further, which we can do because you mentioned so many things where our inertia is in the wrong place. And I think that's what people are afraid of, right? We see the big food industries and animal agriculture at a mass scale heading down this path or just the soil health. It's like There's so much inertia going against soil health that it, it seems like it's hard to turn it around. But it is possible to do, and you just have to start with yourself and start with small decisions. Yeah, I mean, we can just break down each part of this inertia that's kind of working against us and then how to empower ourselves. Maybe we'll start with immune health because that's one of the first things that you have control of, your own immune health, especially during COVID time. So what do you do for your immune health? Yeah, well, you know, (laughs) I would love to see somebody, a very high level official uh, like a Dr. Fauci, step forward to the microphone on one of these um, press conferences and say, "Okay, America, here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend one week working on our immune system. Are you with me here on this? Can we do that? Let's spend one week working on our immune system. So the first thing we're going to do, we're not going to drink any sugary soft drinks for a week. Coke and Pepsi and Dr. Pepper and Mountain Dew, you know, they're out. (laughs) <laughs> we're, we're not going to drink any mm-hmm. of them all week. Prohibition on that. The second thing is we're not going to eat junk food. We're not going to eat candy bars. We're not going to eat fast food, McDonald's. We're not going to eat all that junk food and stuff that you can't pronounce. What we're going to do is we're going to get whole foods, everything that you can pronounce. And if you can't find it, you can now, there are so many farms, including ours, that are selling on the internet. You can get it on the internet as well. Shipped to your doorstep. In person, yeah. In person, yeah. yeah. There are a lot of local farms from farmer's markets to you know local farm distribution networks. So jump on that. And listen, don't worry about overpowering it. The naysayers would immediately say, well, there's not enough there. Well, try us. Just try us. <laughs> Before you discount what we can do, alternatively, just do it. All right. The next thing we're going to do is uh, we're all going to work up a sweat. For 20 minutes a day, just I don't care whether you take a a little jog or run in place or do sit ups, but we're going to work. We're going to do something to dig a garden, put up in a garden pit, plant a tree. (laughs) We're going to do something where we work up a sweat physically with physical exercise 20 minutes a day. And then we're going to get eight to eight and a half hours of sleep every night. You're not going to stay up and watch the late TV show or anything. You're going to go to sleep. You're going to go to bed and you're going to get at least eight hours of sleep each night. Next, we're going to each drink water. We're going to hydrate for a week. America is dehydrated. We need to drink at least three quarts of water a day. So if you want to line it up, we're going to drink three quarts of water today. Do that. And, um, We're going to get some sunshine, go out and get a little bit of sunshine each day. And finally, we're going to forgive. Write down all the people you hate and the people you'd like to get even with and forgive them. Mm. If we did that for one week, cut the junk, eat well, get some exercise, get some sunshine and sleep and hydrate and forgive, that is is a recipe that if we actually had a national initiative to do that, it would fundamentally change the health trajectory in this country. I 100% agree. And I've been kind of just railing on about this, that no health officials ever said that. Big people are saying this. Bill Maher is saying this. There's people on the conservative side saying this. Everyone's saying this. And no government officials will comment on it because I 100% agree with everything you said. Even the forgiveness part is a cool new one, but that's sort of a stress relief, I think, right? If you're not harboring this ill intention towards people, you have less stress. And well, there's many other benefits too. I mean, positivity is amazing. Yes. 
What yes. else do you do? Even just getting outside. I mean, I heard that you drink from the cattle trough. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I just think that our microbiome, I think that as a culture, we have become so sterile that our microbiome is literally at half diversity, if you will. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in his famous book, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel, Jared Diamond talked about the ascendancy of cultures throughout history and talked about the power of germs. And, of course, a lot of um, the alternative health community has signed on to the hygiene hypothesis, which says that the immune system is much like a, a muscle and it needs routine exercise. And if it doesn't get exercised, then it becomes lethargic so that when something actually does come along, pollen or whatever, COVID-19, whatever, uh, mm -hmm. that suddenly it goes into overdrive and you have all these incredible reactions and sicknesses and, and symptoms as a result of the immune system being lethargic. So, uh, yeah, for me, of course, you know, I'm in the soil all the time. I mean, I'm routinely think about how people used to get splinters and calluses and um, well, just dirty hands. Yeah. Just yeah. Dirty hands at the very yeah. least. The thing is, and I don't, I don't want everybody to think that I'm wanting to go back to 1850 because I'm glad that we now have infection fighters like antibiotics and things that they didn't have back then. I mean, the, if you got a burn and there were a lot of burns, I mean, the number, the number one cause of death in women in 1900 was childbirth. The number two cause was uh, burns because, you know, mm. they wore these big skirts and they were cooking on fireplaces and, you know, mama turns around and gets her skirt too close to the fire. And suddenly there goes mom up in burns and without, all the the cool things that technology that we have medical technology today most of those got infected and then the next thing you know mom is dead because the infection from the burns mm -hmm. i don't want to go back but people at that time were dying of infections and that sort of thing infectious disease today we're dying of non-infectious disease which are primarily lifestyle created and we're also seeing a tremendous problem with food allergies. I mean, anyone over, well, you know, I'm over 60, but anyone basically over 50 years old right now, we can remember the first time we heard the word food allergy, and it was only about 30 years ago. You could have a birthday party for your kids, and you didn't have to ask every mom, uh, <laughs> do your, does your child have food allergies? You could have a church potluck and not worry about what you brought because nobody was allergic to anything. And so what's happened is that as our microbiome has become more and more lethargic, our immune system is not being exercised, we're living in a more and more sterile environment where we have a lethargic immune system and we have a half-populated a half microbiome. And the combination of those two things are absolutely deadly for non-infectious, not infectious disease, but non-infectious diseases. And then something like a virus comes along and, you know, you're toast. Well, this is the hugest point ever. I've also kind of mentioned in a few episodes that it's kind of the germ versus terrain theory. And I don't know if there's more to it, but the high level idea is that germs are always around and you can't stop that. The flu goes around each year. The colds go around each year. But if you have a good terrain, which is your body, if you have a good immune system, they fight them off. It's like, I don't get sick anymore. Once I started changing my diet and lifestyle, I haven't gotten sick. It comes, it goes. I can handle it. I'm anti-fragile. I have a strong immune system. So that's the big thing is people are scared of a germ, but that's not the point. You can't be scared of germs. They're always there. You have to just have the strong body and strong immune system. Yes. And by the way, we don't have this germ. We don't have uh, COVID because there was a lack of vaccine. Mm-hmm that came independent of vaccines or anything else. It was just Dr. Zach Bush talks about this a lot. Just it, these things mutate, they adapt. This is not a partisan thing at all. I don't even want to go there. The fact is the world is mm -hmm. evolving. There are new things. And the thing is we need to adapt and evolve along with it. And if we fill ourselves with sterilization and refuse to allow ourselves to be viscerally 
embedded and nested into our ecological umbilical, we will find that notion that we can levitate away from our uh, Mm -hmm. ecological moorings is a pipe dream. It doesn't work. And eventually, we become sterile. In fact, the sperm count in America, the sperm counts in America are plummeting. Interestingly, in Africa, they are not. Mm. Why are especially American sperm counts uh, plummeting? Well, it's because as you have an annihilation sterilization program, including pesticides and herbicides uh, in the environment, it naturally moves into that direction. You, You can't divorce a sterilization ethic, a sterilization ethic on the farm from a sterilization ethic in your microbiome and even in your reproductive capacity. Nature tends to take whatever whatever ethic. Yeah, it's an obvious, it gets there eventually. Yeah, whatever ethic we bring to the soil, eventually we bring that into ourselves. Absolutely. That's why it's so important well, to do things correctly and not use all the pesticides and herbicides, but also to get contact with the soil. And there's good science on this. I don't have all these studies in front of me, but there's great studies on showing how if you over sanitize, their problems occur. There's all these things with more allergies, more this, more that, and just how going out in nature and being interacting with the soil, the good soil, <laughs> helps your microbiome. Yes. That's why I drink out of the cow trough. <laughs> Um, I don't drink out of it uh, every day, but when I'm there and the water's pretty clean, I don't I don't drink kind of a little bit nasty pond water or something. But if it's good water coming from a well or a spring or something like that, absolutely. I just get down there. The cows, you know, they're they're dripping their saliva, you know, right next to me, and I just bend right down there and drink it. And I'm not saying this cavalierly, like some sort of proud. I'm saying it. What I'm doing, I'm humbly coming to this dependency on our nest and saying, uh, satiate me in this nest. I don't want to be out of this nest. I depend on this nest. And so what can I do to show my, my link, my dependency as a collaborator with this womb, if you will? And um, that's part of it. I mean, I appreciate you saying you don't get sick. I mean, again, I don't think I've been sick in about 15 years. I mean, not anything. Mm-hmm. And I'm again, I don't mm-hmm. say that arrogantly or boastfully. I say it as a giving honor, <laughs> giving honor and glory, if you will, to a system that fundamentally wants to be well. If you go to any normal farm conference, any conventional farm conference, 90% of the discussion and the, the sessions and the workshops are all about disease, sickness, illness, something. They're always about that. And so the conventional farmer is immersed in this kind of sickness, you know, sickness, weeds, disease, pathogen paradigm. And as if nature is fundamentally flawed, nature's fundamentally sick, and we have to make it well. And mm. we're complete, we invert that narrative. On our farm, we come and say nature is fundamentally well. And if something is out of whack, probably we did something that brought it out of whack. And so we're constantly seeking to try to learn how does nature fundamentally work to bring about wellness, to bring about abundance, and to bring about healing. How does it do that? And every time we deviate from nature's template, we find ourselves picking up pieces. But when we hit stride and we hit it right, my goodness, it's a confluence of all sorts of neat things that happen. It's great. Mm. We're kind of edging on the solution to all this is to be part of the system. And there's being part of the system. Nature works in cycles. It's Nature has harmonious cycles for all of history. And if we're a part of them, it works. If we stray from that, it doesn't work. So you know, you're talking about these conferences and the whole healthcare system is the same thing. It's how do we fight nature? How do we go around the system? How do we have extra inputs to fix things when the solution is always be part of it. And we could get into the soil health and all this stuff in a second, but just to the immune health that people don't think about being part of the system is what you've just laid out is like for good immune health, you have to be part of the system, which means you're getting microbes and germs and little pieces of soil 
and interacting with them. And that's helping you. We're made up of more, our microbiome is, has, what is it? More cells or DNA than a human. So we need to just be part of the system. You and I, our bodies are actually only 15% human and 85% non-human. You know, when I was in, when I was in uh, 10th grade biology in high school, I well remember studying, you know, the human cell. And I have struggled. I don't remember ever being told. I mean, we were told that the cell has a wall, it has a nucleus. But I don't remember ever being told that within that cell are actual bacteria, that there are actually independent bacteria smaller than the cell living within the cell that makes it work. That is information in my lifetime. And it's a little bit about what we're discovering with the soil. The same thing with the soil. We've only named, I think, 10% of the beings in the soil. 90% are still unnamed and uncategorized as to function. So, you know, we know about actinomycetes and mycelia. And just literally in the last 20 years, we've learned about glomalin. And we're beginning to learn about this underground commercial cafe where the, um, the bacteria come up to this uh, kind of thin free trade zone at the root hairs. And so the plant takes in carbohydrates and sugars. And uh, here comes a bacteria carrying a little bit of zinc and they make a trade. And I'll trade you some zinc for a little bit of that sugar, you know. And this underground cafe is ongoing in the quadrillions and quadrillions of interchanges. In fact, in our bodies, that same trading is happening. I'll trade you this for that. We're literally a part of a quadrillion exchanges per second in our own bodies, our own cell structure. That's how complex it is. And so rather than trying to figure out how each one of these works and a drug that'll switch this one on and switch that one on, How about we just look at the big picture and say, okay, what are basically big things that I can do, that I can participate in, that all the good guys in my body are going to enjoy? You know, they're not going to enjoy, they're not going to enjoy a bunch of Coke. They're not going to enjoy cigarettes. They're not going to enjoy drugs. In fact, they're not even going to enjoy hate and vengeance. And they're not going to enjoy sleep deprivation. They're not going to enjoy dehydration. 90% of Americans are dehydrated. Uh, They're not going to enjoy unpronounceable food, unpronounceable items, things that you you can't make in your kitchen Mm -hmm. and you can't read Mm -hmm. on a a label. To me, that's so basic. It's like the ABCs, start there. And will there still be Mm -hmm. people that have anomalies? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There will always be the fringe pathogen sickness, whatever, out on the fringe. But goodness, pick the easy fruit first. The easy fruit is this basic (laughs) nutritional hydration, forgiveness, sleep exercise that's not impossible for most people to do. The lion's share of people can do that. That will take care of a huge amount of, of things. Absolutely. And that's the empowering part is people have to change. It's just, I guess it's just not easy. It's just modern society doesn't set people up for success to do all those changes that the people listening have probably done all of those, but they have been motivated some way or another. They've built a tribe or family to help them and, or they've just done it by sheer will. I guess a lot of people maybe even understand a lot of things you laid out. They just can't do them. They can't execute the plan because they're just so ingrained into the system that we've set up. It's like all of our problems just come from our modern systems. That's again, that's an inertia. It's like the modern ideas are just watch Netflix, you go to your job, you get in your car, you do this and that. People are just ingrained in the system. And it's all the people who are going outside the system or the bad system. There's a good system and a bad system. So if you go outside the modern norms, I call them just, I guess it's easier said than done. Well, sure it is. (laughs) Everything, (laughs) Everything that's valuable comes with a price. And if you value your health, it's going to come with a price. You can't just uh, abuse yourself for 30 years and then expect when you hit 50 years old that some medical expert is going to be able to fix you like you can put a new engine in a car. You can't do that. And so changing the trajectory It's a little bit like the um, National Arbor Foundation. They say, when's the best time to plant a tree? You know, yesterday. 
When was the best mm-hmm. time to start making some of these changes? Well, yesterday. And you can't do it all at once. You know, that's why Cena and I wrote the book, Beyond Labels, is to take people by the hand and coach through incrementalism. You can't do all this at once, but you can do something at once. And so you kind of set up a, a bit of a roadmap and... Um, Maybe you can't work up a sweat every day. Well, that's okay. Pick a day this week. What day do you want to do it? Look at your schedule. Pick a day and say, this day, I'm going to work up a sweat. I'm going to work till I'm, I've got some sweat you know, in my armpits and, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> dripping off my face. And pick your day. And, and when you get it done once, you know, it'll be easier to do it again. That's inertia. See, mm-hmm. that's the power of movement. If you move at all toward any of this, it'll become an easier and easier to move toward all of it. Mm. Well, so talk about the more specific stuff. So soil health seems to be, so yeah, just to move away from just the body and what we can do, I was thinking about the biggest problems in the world and soil health might be one of the biggest problems, like physical problems that we're dealing with because the way we're doing all of our food, big food and big agriculture is making the soil worse. And then the stuff you're doing is making the soil better. Is this the biggest problem? Because people are talking about I mean, really, if you want to talk about climate change, that starts with soil health. Well, it does. I adhere. There are kind of two schools of thought. One is the greenhouse gas, GHG theory of, of climate health or t- climate temperature. There's an alternative view, though, and that is the radiator. I call it the radiator view. But it's essentially the fact that moisture condensation is actually the radiator of the planet. It's the cooling system of the planet. GHGs account for only about 5% of planetary temperature. Water condensation accounts for about 95%. So if we're going to go for the big one here, let's talk about condensation. Now, water can condense around a couple of different things, ice crystals and things, but the lion's share of the particles that water vapor needs to condense around. In order to condense, water vapor needs a particle to condense around. And the lion's share of those, by long shot, are little bacteria exudates that come off of vegetation. And to me, this makes a lot of sense because it explains why, with climate change, we see areas that are dry getting drier and areas that are moist getting more moist. Mm. Because when a desert does not have vegetation to make the bacteria for water condensation and cloud formation, the planet tends to compensate for that lack where there is vegetation. So in the temperate areas, America's Midwest, <laughs> the middle of uh, Africa, India, Bangladesh, you know, think about where the massive flooding has been. In much of this temperate middle area, it's been where there is additional vegetation. So when we talk about soil health, when we talk about sequestering carbon and growing vegetation, if, if we want to have cloud formation and good hydration cycles on the planet, which are key to cooling it, then we need to be talking about soil health that can actually grow enough vegetation to make enough leaf area, to make enough bacteria so that vaporized water can condense. Mm -hmm. It's it's a domino thing. And the Mm -hmm. soil, the soil health, the primary way that the soil uh, becomes more fertile is with carbon. Soil did not become fertile because somebody started spreading 10, 10, 10 chemical fertilizer. It came fertile because of carbon. And so this is now where you start going into linking the whole soil fertility up with the fire situation that we're having. As you know, on our farm, we don't buy chemical fertilizer, but that doesn't mean that we're not interested in fertility. What we do do is... We have a couple of commercial-grade chippers, and so we work a lot in the forest, taking down dead trees, dying trees, crooked trees, and thinning, or we call it weeding the forest, taking out the the non-healthy trees primarily, uh, non-productive trees, chipping those, and that then forms our carbon base for composting with our livestock when we do have animals in the wintertime for about 100 days, bedding. We call it a carbonaceous diaper. We do large-scale composting, and then that goes back out on the fields. And we've taken our organic matter 
in 60 years here, we've taken our organic matter from an average of 1% to an average of more than 8% organic matter in 60 years. Now, if we known 60 years ago what we know today, we'd have done it a lot faster, but we've learned as we go. We can absolutely duplicate this much faster on other pieces of land that we rent and lease in the area. If we get onto another piece of land, we can duplicate this much faster today because we know more how to do it. But my point is that biomass, what we want is green biomass, and we want to limit the amount of brown biomass on the soil. We want to get brown biomass into the soil because that is the organic matter that feeds the soil, that feeds the actinomycetes, the gibberellins, and the mycorrhizae to be able to grow more leaf area in more vibrant plants as green carbon above the soil. So the question is, how do we maximize green vegetation and minimize brown vegetation? And in grasses, in prairies, that's done by the herbivore. The herbivore is the pruner, and the herbivore gets freshens up, it prunes that green vegetation prior to it turning brown and recycles it through urine and manure and uh, pruned off root hairs that the plant actually excises to match the pruning that happened on the top. In forests, this happens with fairly routine fire, or it happens with cutting and timber management. And absolutely Native Americans did cut a lot of things. They had primitive tools, but they lit fires routinely. And they used a lot of small diameter, small dimension stuff in their construction and in their you know, domestic cooking. So the wildfire problem, I mean, there are numerous issues. I don't want to dismiss just that things are hotter. Again, things are drier. But why are things drier? Well, they're drier because the brown vegetation is being allowed to build up, choking out the green vegetation. And so we need to cut, prune with animals, with chainsaws, with chippers, and prune out the brown biomass, the combustible biomass, to accentuate, leverage, make room, and accelerate the growth of the green biomass. I don't know how to make it any simpler. The point is that if we, in the U.S. right now, if we took all the money currently spent on chemical fertilizers, and we spent all that money in proper forest management, we would create a carbon economy. We would create carbon value in biomass. We would create an entire industry. It would be as big as uh, gas stations, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. And we would create this to do composting on our farms as an integrated carbon system that would feed our soils carbon instead of chemicals, and that would in turn create water retentive capacity. It would create more biology in the soil, grow more vegetation that would then exude more bacteria to stimulate condensation and cloud formation and timely rains rather than very, very violent storms that are an indicator of environmental imbalance. So mm. to me, it's a fairly simple chain of carbon management in the system. And that's where we need to go. And, and for sure, the, the folks who overlog and overgraze are as guilty of damage as the folks in the radical environmental end that never want to see a person set foot in a wilderness area, uh, lest it be despoiled. And the fact is, both of those extremes are problematic, you know, for healthy ecological function. Whatever you want to call it, you don't even have to call it climate change. I guess you call it imbalance. Whatever imbalance is going on is seems like it's just due to mismanagement of our natural systems. And that people nowadays, especially the elections coming up, I don't want to talk about politics either, but it's become very political about the oh, whole climate change. All of a sudden, you know, it's all about climate change. They're looking at the wrong things. They're blaming the wrong things. What do you think is going on in the West Coast with all these fires? I mean, is it just this mismanaged land? 
Yeah, well, well, it is a number of things. I mean, certainly there's there's been a drought there, but yes, if I were to uh, to attach percentages to it, I would say that it's probably seventy five percent mismanaged land, maybe five percent actual dryness, heat, that sort of thing, and perhaps twenty percent. I think I've still got twenty percent to play with. Twenty mm-hmm. percent <laughs> is probably pushing fire prone houses and living into extremely fragile, fire-prone areas. Mm. As we push into these canyons and um, these kind of areas, you can't push in there with human, with uh, houses, with human activity, without understanding that the historic megafauna, the bison, the elk, the beavers, uh, 500 years ago, North America was 8% water. Today, it's 1% water. And that water surface was created by 200 million beavers. Mm. And some of these beavers were big. Some of these beavers were as big as a very small automobile. There were some very, very large beavers that could take down a lot of trees. The amount of trees, the amount of tree cutting that the beavers did for this labyrinth of water uh, beaver dams throughout the country were way more trees being cut than are necessary to maintain, for example, all the railroads. If you took all the, you know, all the railroad ties and all the railroads, that's a lot of trees. Well, the beavers were taking way more than that. I mean, I don't know that anybody's done a computation on it, but if you've ever seen a beaver dam and seen how much wood it takes to go across for a beaver dam of any size and imagine 200 million beavers in the country working at maintaining 8% surface water 500 years ago, not only did that cut a lot of trees, but it also intertwined a lot of water into areas. I mean, California has a moratorium on ponds. In fact, they, if you have a pond now, they want you to drain it. We don't need to be draining things. We need to be hydrating things. If there's anything that we should be doing, we should be excavating and building more ponds so that the water stays higher on the landscape and doesn't drain away. That's a permaculture concept of trying to keep raindrops as high as possible on the landscape for as long as possible. That's just such a very basic ecological principle, but all the policy is about drainage, get rid of it. Uh, You can't even have a rain barrel. You can't have a pond. That's exactly opposite what we need to be doing. Well, most times when the government gets involved, they seem to kind of make the opposite, (laughs) the wrong choices. And it's always the opposite of the way we should be doing it. It's it's really interesting how they do that. Talk more about this, the megafauna. I mean, people have heard of how many tens and tens of millions of bison, you know, roaming North America. I mean, why are we blaming the cows on this methane problem? (laughs) Well, um, (laughs) I think, yeah, absolutely. We're so myopic, aren't we? I mean, we we really have short memories. This is one reason I wrote the book, Folks, This Ain't Normal, just to help people reconnect with, with the way things were at one time, because we are myopic. We have very short memories. I mean, I talk to a lot of young people, and I mean, a lot of young people. My life is surrounded by young people. I love them to death. But I mean, I mean, routinely now, we have young people that have never seen a typewriter, don't even know what a typewriter is. I mean, I grew up on one, a manual typewriter, you know, mm-hmm. uh, a phonograph record. So we are myopic. And I think it's important to be reminded that 500 years ago, the world had more animal weight in the world. A thousand years ago had more animal weight than it does today with all of the concentrated animal feeding operations, factory farms, and all the people. If you add up all the livestock in CAFOs and all the people living on the planet today, it does not equate to the weight of animals that were on the planet a thousand years ago. Mm. That's just a really critical element. Now, if the animals, if their burping and farting is creating the, the issue, then we should have had it a long time ago when there were way, way more animals. That's one issue. But the second thing is those animals were eating primarily perennials. They were not eating annuals, corn, soybeans, wheat, rye, oats. There was no tillage. There was very little tillage. 
Tillage was laborious. Tillage was expensive. Tillage was reserved for people grain. You didn't feed animals grain because it was too expensive and too valuable. So all these domestic and wild animals were primarily being the foundation of it all was perennials, not annuals. What does it explain that? A perennial is a plant that you, you don't have to plant it every year. An annual exactly. is a plant that you have to plant every year. Okay, so grasses and, of course, some forage-type plants like clovers are biannuals. And, you know, they have a two-year cycle. Some are, have different cycles. But the point is that there is a growth factor in which these perennials, some legumes, grasses, uh, some medics, forbs, herbs, plantain is a great example of one. They're in prairies. In fact, the original you know, North American prairies, most archaeologists now agree that a typical American prairie of uh, 300 years ago contained about 40 varieties of plants per acre, 40 different kinds of species of plants per acre. There was a tremendous amount of variety. That's what we call this the salad bar. Um, it, it wasn't mm-hmm. a monoculture. It wasn't a monocrop. And it was a very diversified sward of diversified plants. And when you have a perennial canopy, so you have the soil, then you have a canopy of vegetation. When that canopy is primarily perennial and is highly uh, diversified, the soil, now get this, this is, the, I'm dropping the second shoe here. The soil mm-hmm. then is full of a bacteria called methanotrophic bacteria. If you take off the first part of that, methane, it's methanotrophic bacteria. There's enough methanotrophic bacteria to take the methane out of the atmosphere directly above the plants to the tune of what would be generated by a thousand cows per acre. So Mm. nature has extremely efficient built-in balancing mechanisms to deal with every potential problem that comes from production. And the thing is, these methanotrophic bacteria do not live under corn. They do not live under soybeans. They do not live under parking (laughs) lots. They don't live under soccer fields. They don't live under football fields. And they don't live under your lawn They live in a special high organic matter, highly biologically diversified, perennial canopied environment. It is that canopy that the herbivores encourage and thrive on. And that is the canopy that was over most of the planet until extremely recent years with massive mechanization and cheap energy that allowed us to plow and till and cover much of this land area with monocrops, monocultures, and annuals that destroy the methanotrophic bacteria that were there to digest the methane from the herbivores who were pruning the beautiful prairies of diversified perennials uh, that were so lush and producing such volumes of animals prior to um, modern days. This is... The crux of it. This is why it's so absurd that people think we can make fake meat, whether that's from plant foods that are have to be monocropped or from it's just cell grown in labs. Because you're saying the whole diversity of the system, the whole way that the world operates is through these vast areas of mixed use land with plants and animals working together. Inherently, it's impossible to separate this and try to make it work. Like no matter how good the technology is of cell-based meat, you can't replicate these vast networks of methanotrophic bacteria and the millions, quadrillions of exchanges that go on that you're talking about. If you're covering land with concrete and giant buildings and giant vats of fake meat culture. Yes, you are exactly right. And I would like to just, if I could wade into the weeds just a moment for you with this, I think that the the single biggest philosophical Achilles heel of the whole fake meat program, as you said, whether it's beyond meat, plant-based stuff, or whether it's cell-grown material in a vat, the whole proposition of that idea 
is simplicity, that somehow we can simplify this beyond complex, even to the point of being mysterious, that we can somehow wade into that mystery and complexity and simplify it to a lab experiment. And I would suggest, you know, I don't have a scientific research on this, but I would suggest that, again, just like we talked about a sterility ethic in the soil creates a sterility ethic in people, I would suggest that a simplicity ethic in food creates a simplicity ethic in the microbiome, which then creates a simplicity ethic in our own brains. We now know, for example, that there is a very direct relationship between the gut and the emotions between the microbiome and our own brain functions. When we say, what do you feel in your gut? We're not talking about if you have a bellyache. We're talking about what do you think? What's your most basic, thoughtful intuition of mm-hmm. whatever you know, whatever the, the question is before you? And it turns out that that's actually extremely true. And so think about a bacteria in our microbiome that needs, for example that in order to really thrive, it needs some enzyme from plantain, okay? Plantain. A plantain has all sorts of medicinal qualities. It's an herb that grows perennially in pastures. It's all over the place in good, healthy pastures. A cow comes along and grazes that plantain, or of course, historically, a bison or a a wildebeest, but grazes that plantain, that plantain structure is digested through that animal, goes into its cell structure. We eat that cell structure as a steak or a hamburger, and we then, our microbiome gets to ingest, could we call it nuance of plantain? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Nuance of plantain. Suddenly, our microbiome is complexed. It's no longer just simple. It's complex Mm. by nuance of plantain. You cannot, nuance of plantain perhaps has a nuance that actually feeds some cell structure in our mental capacity. So if we're going to actually have mental capacity to think in complex terms, to think through difficult issues, We need to have a more complex microbiome, which comes from a more uh, more complex food source, which comes from a more complex plant and animal source from a more complex soil source. Mm, And mm -hmm. I wonder if as we have simplified the soil with chemical fertilizers, and now we're starting to simplify our diets with vegetarianism, veganism, and denying it the nuance of what meat and fish and poultry and eggs bring to the diet in that perennial landscape. As we simplify all of this through, are we not possibly simplifying our ability even to think? Mm. I love that. And I've had doctors on here talk about the problems when people go vegan with their brain and depression and lower brain mass and all kinds of stuff. So I definitely think there's some science associated with this. And also, maybe you could comment on this. I brought it up recently on a podcast about we're not alchemists. Like we're getting into the realm of alchemy when we're talking about these cell-based meats that we can somehow cheat nature and create something out of nothing or that somehow that all the sum of the parts that will somehow equal that amazing ribeye that you grow over in Virginia, that the audacity of these cell-based people, and I've met them, I went to a conference I spoke at, and they had all the presentations, and they were so fancy, and it looked all great until I thought about it, that it was fake. It, It can't be true. How are you going to get the most complex systems on Earth with quadrillions of interactions and to take these amino acids and upcycle them into glorious minerals and vitamins and proteins that we need to live? How are you going to do that in a lab? Like, how... Like, what's the the math on the the highest level that they're doing that they can say with all the refrigeration and all the stuff they needed, how are you going to create a ribeye? To me, it's almost, it's impossible. I don't know how anyone can prove that this is possible, that the sum of the parts 
are going to somehow be less environmentally taxing if you're doing it all. It seems like no matter what, it's going to be higher. It almost like double. Like if you're doing all taking all these inputs and trying to put them in to just make a ribeye that can be made from a cow and some soil and some grass and some sunlight. Has anyone answered this question? Like they're trying to say they're alchemists. They're creating matter of nothing. They're finding the laws of physics. Yeah, well, it actually takes a lot of energy flowing in there, you know, so that's why they have soybeans and flax seeds. I mean, there's there's a huge amount of input. Sugar beets, I mean, there's the inputs going in are massive because, yeah, because you can't create something out of nothing. It's, it's absolutely impossible to create something out of nothing. As you say, it's alchemy. So the fact is that they don't want to take pictures of all of the inputs that are going in. And there are train car loads of inputs going in. Where are those coming from? What kind of devastation are those creating on the planet? And there's really been no viable organic production system, organic cropping system, that's been possible without some sort of animal input, whether it's fish meal or you know manure. I mean, many of the best organic farming and gardening gurus in the country they buy in compost. And much of that compost is made from livestock production systems. Yeah, from animals. Well, even that's the cell-based side too. I was referring to the cell-based side as well. I don't get how they're proposing they're going to create these complex amino acids and proteins and vitamins and minerals out of in a lab that isn't going to require more energy or inputs than what nature can do for millions of years with cows on grass in the sun. Yeah, I don't see it either. But I think in fairness, yeah, I'm completely with you on the problem of the whole cell structure and all that sort of thing. But I think in all fairness, we have to recognize that there's this huge kind of guilt complex on the world, on society, about how domestic livestock is raised in these concentrated animal feeding operations, how crops are raised with chemicals. There's this huge pushback. And mm-hmm. that's what's driving the desire for you know Impossible Burger, Beyond Meat, and the vegan uh, diet stuff as well. The beautiful thing is that it doesn't have to be one or the other. The beautiful thing is that if we simply look at nature's template and duplicate it on a commercial domestic production model, and we get the animals out, and we put them on perennials, and we integrate them rather than segregate them, and we actually simply duplicate what nature does, then suddenly it's abundant, it's healing, it's productive, we're not all going to starve, and nature then works fundamentally with complex synergies rather than simplistic independence. And I think that that is an ultimately very positive, very hopeful kind of of understanding of how nature works. We don't have to either all be vegans or destroy the planet with cows. Mm -hmm. Our cows can actually heal the planet and we can enjoy that burger from cows who actually heal the planet. And if everybody would understand that that is possible, and then participate in it, then the other, the damaging system would simply um, implode. (laughs) It Mm -hmm. would implode when Mm -hmm. when nobody patronizes it. It's really that simple. It is. Well, it's so weird how these anti-meat activists operate, where yes, we all agree, everyone listening and yourself, that we're not doing animal agriculture in the right way on the mass you know, levels, industrial agriculture system. But that doesn't mean you throw it out. It's an absurd thing. It doesn't make any sense. They just go, it's obvious they have just some kind of other agenda. And then they try to tie in the nutrition to it. And they they try to make all these other excuses why it's bad. No, we just do the better system. We do go back to the way that nature works. And then all the problems are solved and we're healthy. And the land is healthy. The animals are doing well. And everything yeah. works. <laughs> right. Yeah, I liken it to uh, imagine if you and I were on uh, Pluto and uh, Pluto decided, they looked down there at that planet Earth and said, yeah, I wonder how those people you know, do things down there. Let's, who wants to volunteer to go down and, and look at their education system and see how they teach their kids? That might be something we can learn from them. So you and I volunteer. We jump in a flying saucer and we zip down to Earth 
And we happened to land in the worst school district with the worst superintendent and the worst school board in the yard of the worst school with the worst principal and go visit the worst classroom with the worst teacher. (laughs) (laughs) And so we spend our two days collecting data and we fly back to Pluto. Of course, they greet us and say, well, you know, what did you find? And we say, well, my lens, (laughs) if we did education like that, we'd do better not to do any education. Let, 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 you know, they do better not to have any education. And that's what's happened with the data points with, um, you know, with conventional livestock. It's an extremely dysfunctional system, but that forms the foundation of the database, the, the climatologists and the entropy energy, you know, scientists and, and everybody else that's working on this. Those provide the data points and they're horrible data points. And I agree with the horrible data points, but the answer is not eliminate all the animals. The answer is to reinsert the animals in their historic moving, mobbing, mowing, you know, healing characteristic paradigm, and um, all will be well. It, it really is that simple. It doesn't have to be extreme this or extreme that. The beauty of this is we actually can have our cake and eat it too. Mm-hmm. We can have our ribeye, we can have our hamburger, and heal the planet. That's the most hopeful thing that we can imagine. Cool. Have our steak and eat it too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Have, this is a perfect segue into everyone's question. This is the the burning question and comment on all sides of this. And I get a lot of these vegans that pop up on my social media. They're like, oh, well, that's great, but you can't feed the world that way. So, and I've talked to a lot of people about this and thought a lot about it. So how do we do this on the, the mass scale to feed the world? And do we need to think about feeding the entire world at once, or do we need to be worried about feeding our community, which by default, de facto, will feed the world? Yeah, well, those are both related questions. I like to tackle this one, and it is one of my most frequently asked questions. And I like to tackle it first by saying, right now, the world is producing half again as much food as the world needs. We are now throwing away almost 50% of all human edible food. That's from a lot of reasons. Uh, It spoils. We actually, our industrial food chains are actually highly inefficient. If you look at the dumpster behind the average supermarket and see what's out there, you will realize how inefficient it is. The spoilage is unbelievable. Sell-by dates. And then you have you have uh, a blemished food. I mean, I was uh, talking to a fellow recently who had uh, just come from Zimbabwe, from a green bean manufacturing facility in uh, Zimbabwe. And um, he said they literally, they had one, for every ton that they could package, this was going to Europe, uh, to the European market, for every ton they had to sell, they had one ton that they threw away. I said, well, you know, you're throwing away half of them. Why are you throwing them away? He said, well, because they're too long, they're too short, they're too fat, they're too thin, they have a little uh, squiggly, they're not straight, I mean, any number of things. And I've been on picking crews, for example, in uh, vegetable farms in Colorado and places, and the wasted fruit, the wasted vegetables, it's unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. So anybody who thinks we're running out of food, we're not running out of food. We have way more food than we need. If anything, we're drowning in abundance. Nobody starved because there's not enough food. Now, are people starving? Yes, indeed. But they're not starving because there's not enough food. They're starving because the road isn't good enough to get a truck to it, or some um, some tyrant, you know, won't let businesses engage in commerce on the local level. I mean, there's you know, there's a million reasons why people starve, but it's not because there's not enough food. That's the first thing. Number two, uh, it's mismanagement. It, Sorry, yeah, it, it is. To, it, I just want to, it's always mismanagement. It's like I had Alan Savory on. It's about mismanagement of land. It's always mismanagement. Yes, it is. And so that that brings us then to to the second point on this is if we had an integrated system instead of a segregated system, we could grow way more food. For example, right now the United States has. 35 million acres of yard, of lawn, and 36 million acres growing, housing, and feeding recreational horses. Now, I don't hate horses, 
and I don't hate lawns. But my point is, that's 71 million acres, and that's enough to feed our entire country without a single farm. Mm. So the problem is that we have segregated our food system. We're going to grow the food over here, and we're going to recreate over here or whatever. You know, we've, And we don't integrate any of it. And so finally, from a production standpoint, yes, if we started moving, mobbing, and mowing, what we call mob stocking, herbivorous solar conversion, lignified carbon sequestration, fertilization, if we started practicing that with just our herbivores and then link up the poultry with them, the birds, the chickens, and the turkeys and stuff, if we did that multi-species, pasture-based, wildlife templated model paradigm, not only would we produce all the food we'd need, we'd produce so much that we couldn't imagine why in the world we didn't do this long time ago. So there is plenty. (laughs) I mean, on our farm, for example, I'll, I'll just give you a couple numbers. On our farm, for example, let's just take cows. In Augusta County, our county, the cow days per acre and a cow day is what one cow will eat in a day. So in our county, So the average acre will feed 80 cows for one day a year or one cow for 80 days a year. That's 80 cow days per acre. On our farm, we get on average 400 cow days per acre. That's not a 10% Mm. increase. It's not a 20% increase. It's a multiplicative increase. Now imagine if the neighbor would duplicate that and if his neighbor would duplicate that and if the whole county would duplicate that and the whole state would duplicate that. The fact is, you can hardly wrap your head around the abundance that nature wants to provide. Mainline agriculture works on the the paradigm of kind of violence and wrestling, as if creation is some sort of a reluctant partner that we have to wrestle and, I'm going to make you do this. You know, we've got all this kind of uh, wrestling match going on, when actually nature is a benevolent lover just desiring for us to caress in the right places. Absolutely. If we could not only increase the production of the land, but also we could change the land or even just take land that wasn't productive at all and using holistic management. You know, Alan Savory has a famous TED talk about desertification and reversing desertification. How much land is not even useful that could be if we put herbivores on it? Yes. Millions and millions and millions of acres. And I would go even beyond just putting herbivores on it. I would include permaculture and excavating swales and doing, you know, hydration uh, things. So many techniques we can do to reverse desertification. There are a lot of tools in our toolbox on that specific question. I've seen places in extremely dry areas like the Middle East literally turn into almost an oasis goodness, the climatology department at the University of Wisconsin uh, 40 years ago did a a project in the Rajputan Desert of India where they simply fenced off a few square miles from the nomadic herders that were overgrazing all the time because of the problem of the commons. And within two years, they had vegetation sprouting and clouds forming and precipitation occurring on those few square miles of research plot simply by regulating the access of the animals. This is, of course, Alan Savory's shtick. There are lots of tools in our box. We are not helpless in this. We are not. And this notion that we're all just doomed to die unless the Paris Climate Accord Treaty Mm. gets passed. And I'm not trying to disparage all that. I appreciate the discussions. But as you said, when you look to big United Nations agencies and government agencies to do it, they never really come up with practical solutions. They're always some sort of a very expensive, uh, difficult, techno-glitzy solution that lines the pockets of big multinational corporations instead of actually practically healing at a local indigenous level where we live. Well. That's another crux of it. All the things that are going wrong in the world to go beyond just food systems seem to be because these big powers that be try to centralize things. And people want this globalism and they want, oh, we're going to have 
new new world where there's no borders and everyone's we're going to end poverty and people can look up the World Economic Forum. They talk about all this, the great reset. We're going to use the pandemic for the great reset and we're going to, everything's going to be better because we're going to run things at the highest level and there's going to be and no poverty and the UN and the WHO are all part of this. And it's always just the opposite of what we want. You're talking about decentralizing. We want to be governed on the smallest level. We don't want to be governed on a world level that never works out for people. No. You want to have the most local government, the most local food, the most local everything. And this goes beyond politics. I don't care what kind of politics you have. You should understand this, that whenever it gets to the highest level and trying to govern, these leaders don't have your interests in mind when it gets that far away from you, right? If you're so far away from this leader, how do you expect them to have your best interests in mind? And it just always fails. And it's we see it failing in agriculture. The bigger it gets and the, the further it goes away from a local farm like Joel's, the worse it gets. And so we need to just figure out how to get back to this small scale stuff. Decentralization. This is what you talk about, yes. right? You want to decentralize things. Right. And in fact, at the height of the COVID thing back in you know March and April, when store shelves were empty and the big processing plants were shutting down due to uh, people getting sick in them, that showed the emperor had no clothes. That showed the actual fragility of these, quote unquote, efficient uh, centralized systems. The little small plants around the country and our processing here with a few people, you know, we didn't have any problems because we weren't 4,000 people shoulder to shoulder in a cold, dark, damp environment every day, uh, living in squalid living conditions outside. And so there is a tremendous value in scale by duplication rather than scale by amalgamation. I mean, look at honeybees. Honeybees don't make their hives. They don't make bigger and bigger and bigger hives. When the hive gets, you know, more than its whatever capacity, capacity, yeah. they swarm. They swarm. They make another hive. This is scale. This is increasing or growth, if you will, by duplication rather than by centralization. And all good functional systems eventually move this direction. I mean, even when Joel Arthur Barker in the 1970s wrote the book Paradigms and introduced that concept to the world, he had these axioms of paradigms. And one of the axioms, I remember it well, uh, was that all paradigms tend to exceed their efficiency at some point. So mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what the paradigm is, and this is why scale always finally collapses on itself because you simply can't control correctly that many moving parts. It's just the way life is. And so that's why many of us are, you know, tend to be libertarians politically because we want the power and the authority and the autonomy, as you said, at the most local level possible. Wendell Berry writes about this not as a politician, but as a steward of the land, he says, in order for the land to be stewarded well, it must be loved well. And in order to be loved well, it must be known well. And you can only know so big a chunk of it. And as soon as you get a chunk that's too big to know, then you don't love it and you don't steward it well. And you exploit it rather than nurturing it. And of course, he, he writes eloquently on that. But I think he's exactly right. You know, the Chinese have this wonderful saying if everybody sweeps in front of their own doorstep, the world will be clean. And I think there's a lot of truth in that as well. That's amazing. Well, that's what I was going to bring up next is if we feed our community, by default, we feed the world. And then also, I have to throw in another Wendell Berry quote, which I love. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, and are treated by the health industry, which pays no attention to food. <laughs> yeah, that's classic Berryism. Yes. I want to be able to write like him when I grow up. <laughs> I mean, he's a genius. And so get back to the feeding our community to feed the world. I mean, California can feed itself. Or I had this other podcast with this farmer in Australia, and he was kind of fighting back against me a little bit on feeding the world. He thinks that we need to be sort of more plant-based to feed the world, maybe just to get calories, because not everyone can eat just tons of animal foods and nutrient-dense, bioavailable, you know, great animal-based diets like a lot of people are today. But, you know, it's fine. Not everyone wants to do that. So eat your well-grown plant foods that can be part of the system. So it's fine. But anyway, 
can the United States feed itself or can California feed itself? Uh, absolutely. California could feed itself, but what it would have to do is quit exporting to the world. So the nuts, the almonds that it grows and the, here's the deal, and all the, um, the leafy greens that it grows and exports all over. Mm -hmm. It could feed itself completely, but what we need is for Vermont and New Hampshire and Virginia and North Dakota and South Dakota, we need all of the northern tier states to put solariums on all their structures. And if everybody had solariums, we have one on our house. Our house was built in 1790, but we have a really beautiful cedar built solarium on the south side. We can grow uh, cool hardy things like spinach and lettuces and things like that through the winter with no supplemental heat whatsoever. And we just harvest it and eat it ourselves. Mm. If every structure had a southern solarium on it in the northern areas, we wouldn't need to import greens from California. Then all that land could feed California and California wouldn't have to import stuff from, you know, who knows where, Colorado or whatever. The point is, wherever you go in the world, everybody's not going to grow bananas or coffee or, you know, have spices and things like that. There's certainly going to be trade, but mm -hmm. um, for sure, everywhere you go in the world, there is the capacity, there is the capacity to feed itself, certainly regionally, if not countrywide. I'll just go out on a limb and say pretty much every country could feed itself. Now, somebody's going to push back and say, well, what about China? Well, China could do way better than it's doing. And China exports a lot. I mean, China exports mm -hmm. more apples to the United States than Washington State produces, mm. supposedly the apple capital of the United States. It's just nuts. I mean, Iowa, arguably the breadbasket of the world, Iowa imports 93% of its food, 93%. Now, there's no reason for Iowa to import 93% of its food. Hawaii imports 93% of its food. I mean, why does a place that can grow macadamia nuts and bananas and pineapple, why does it have to import all that? In fact, in Hawaii, my understanding is that there's not a legal slaughterhouse on the islands. So if you eat a hamburger in Hawaii, it has to leave the islands be transported by barge to the U.S. mainland and then re-imported as frozen beef into Hawaii. That's absurd. That's absurd. So we just don't have the, um, the commitment, the commitment at pretty much any level to actually integrate our food systems. Uh, we just continue to bifurcate, segregate, and then amalgamate rather than actually localize decentralize and integrate at the regional level so that, for example, every college dining services should have a small chicken house attached to it. So the kitchen scraps mm -hmm. all go into the chickens, the chickens lay the eggs, the eggs go back into the dining services, and you have this wonderful cyclical thing that's simple. That it, We don't need more knowledge. We don't need more technology. We just need to think. Yeah. We just need to think as integrators instead of segregators. It's so simple. And you brought up a study in Belgium, I think it was, yes. about with the chickens. They gave a bunch of houses chickens. Yes, yes. Um, so in Belgium, this was uh, written up in uh, City Chicks by Pat Foreman. In Belgium, a, a city offered three chickens to any family that wanted them. And they had 2,000 families sign up for the program. So they got 6,000 chickens, gave them to the 2,000 families, and in the first month, it reduced food scrap landfill waste by 100 tons in the first month. So these integrated systems are just no-brainers, but people are scared. I mean, we've got cities in America that won't even let a person have a backyard chicken. It takes nine chickens. It takes nine chickens to produce the amount of manure that one average dog produces. Most people don't want nine chickens. They want two, three, four. So we're talking about way less manure than a dog, and chicken manure is not nasty like dog manure. Dog manure is absolutely nasty, uh, but chicken manure is not nasty at all. It's great for you know side dressing your plants and your garden, and it's great. Mm-hmm. 
that's a dream is I know people who have backyard chickens, backyard pigs. I mean, this is the stuff, the solution. This is where we get to the solutions of how to feed the world. So we're running out of time here. For the last kind of topic, you could talk about the true cost of food because you sell food. It's cool. You have a little store on your property and people can buy your food. And also, oh, I just remembered, you're talking about during the pandemic, the smaller you are, the better. I have a company called Nose of Tail. We're in Texas. We have a ranch. We were selling the entire time. We were selling out the entire lockdown because we didn't have these giant systems. That's the way to do it. But when you talk about your meat you produce, and what's the true cost of that? Because people don't factor in all the costs. They, you just look at, oh, well, this is cheaper than that. Yeah. Well, first of all, you got to realize that integrity food is like medicine. We participated with um, Mother Earth News Magazine years and years ago. I mean, I'm like 10 years ago in a study, in a, an egg study, 12 of us around the country that do pastured eggs, sent our eggs to a lab and had them analyzed for nutrients. They did about, I don't know, 10 items to compare to the USDA nutrition label. I'll just pick one, folic acid. Folic acid is really important for pregnant women's health. And so the USDA dietary nutrition label on an egg carton says that an egg contains about 48 micrograms of folic acid per egg. And uh, our eggs uh, averaged 1,038 micrograms Mm. per egg. So again, we're not talking about a 10% deviation. We're talking about major, major deviations. Same thing with omega-3, omega-6, you know, fatty acid ratios uh, that, of course, have a lot to do with cholesterol, different things, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol, all sorts of cool stuff, polyunsaturated fats, all sorts of things. So the short, the quick thing is that this food is not just bushels and pounds, it's uh, nutrient dense. So we've done all sorts of tests where we've checked that. We've even uh, uh, ground beef out of the store and done our ground beef and put it down for cats and taken pictures of the cats. The cats will refuse to eat the store-bought. They eat ours and even lick up the uh, the paper plate before <laughs> they'll even look at the one from the store-bought. And a lot of people trust their cats more than their doctor. So if you don't believe what I'm saying, you know, ask your cat and your cat will tell you what to buy. The food is better. So how do you get that kind of integrity food? Well, it takes more attention. It simply takes more attention. It sometimes takes more people on the farm, more observation, more management, more skill, a little sometimes less economies of scale because you're doing a craft. You're doing an artisan product, not a a commodity. And no more than you would expect a a potter who's hand-throwing bowls on a potter's wheel to give you a 50% discount if you want a thousand of them mm-hmm. by the same token, because this is an artisan craft product, uh, we can't give you a 50% discount if you want a thousand chickens either. Everyone gets cared for, gets observed, gets seen, hand eviscerated, and all of that comes with a price. So we don't apologize. We believe that our food is the cheapest food on the earth if you start looking at price per nutrition. Mm -hmm. and price per externalized costs. Remember, our product is not going to pollute anybody's water. It's not going to give anybody asthma. It's not going to give anybody uh, foodborne illness, diarrhea, Campylobacter, E. coli. Anything that we have is not an antibiotic uh, superbug strain. There's a lot of ecological pathogenic uh, toxicity issues that we never have to deal with because it's an authentic Integrity the right product. system. And that comes with an artisanal cost that is different than simply piling up material as if it's some inanimate piles of protoplasmic structure that we can cobble together as cheaply as possible. <laughs> I think that's the most important part is when you factor in all the costs, if you, even the carbon. I mean, we're producing things cheaply at the expense of the soil and expense of the carbon. But if you factor in the fact that you are sequestering carbon and doing all these other things that aren't hurting the environment but are helping it, yes, I believe that it's the cheapest food you can. Or even the the quote, pay the farmer now or pay pharma later. The healthiness, the fact that you're avoiding healthcare costs if you're eating like this. So people do like to complain about, oh, meat so expensive or grass-fed meat so expensive, but this is a myopic view. 
It is. It's a myopic view. It's also a very short-term view. Look, we're looking at a 500-year horizon. Can we do this? Does this work for 500 years? And the truth is that the food system as we know it in the U.S. does not have a 500-year horizon. You can't continue to deplete the aquifers. You can't continue to desertify, and you can't continue to reduce the nutrition of food without extreme consequences. We're certainly seeing those now with this lexicon of Latin words that we've all learned to say in the last 30 years, Campylobacter, E. coli, Salmonella, Fisteria. And what these are, are nature on its knees begging us, enough, stop, enough. And the question is, will we listen, change the trajectory, change our direction, go an opposite way, and do the right thing. The answer is not slowing down the current direction. If you're going the wrong way on the highway, you don't get where you want to go if you just slow down going the wrong way. You've got to actually turn around <laughs> and go the mm -hmm. opposite direction. And that's where we've <laughs> got to be. That's where we've got to be in the U.S. right now. I love it. It's a great note to go out on. So we've kind of come full circle, the inertia and empowerment. Will you give your closing words to wrap it all together? Well, you know, people ask me, uh, what gets you up in the morning? For me, it is just the honor and privilege of knowing that I can step out from that back porch and I can actually collaborate with creation, with God, with, I mean, whatever you want to call, but I can collaborate as a participant in the stewardship of the land and healing of a system. I can't do it all, but I can do a little part of it. And every single person has that same privilege. You know, we say, I'm going to go commune with nature. Well, let me tell you something. You are already communing nature. You don't have to go to the Rocky Mountains. You don't have to go to a national park. You don't have to go to some sweat lodge to commune with nature. You are actually a part and parcel of nature. Every place you are, everything you do, and every place you live. And so the question is, are we living with conscience? Are we living with an awareness of the influence of what we do, what we think, what we say? Are we living with that influence? And are we ultimately healing with our actions, our attitudes, and our aspirations? Are we actually healing with those? Who's winning in this great trajectory of life? Who's winning for our grandchildren? If we could bring to our conscious level that kind of thought process, then we would actually think as much about earthworms as we do about the stock market. And that would be a good place to be. <laughs> I love that. I think make farming cool again. I've been saying that on some of these podcasts. You mentioned it before. If where are these people going to work? Technology is not going to save us. People want to work with their hands. Let's get out there and do all the things you just said. And I think that's a satisfying, productive way to spend your life. Yes, I agree. <laughs> Thank you so much for going long form with me. We have a little bonus thing for the Sapien tribe if you could stick around for a few more minutes. But thank you for all that you do and, and for spreading the message. Thank you, Brian. It's been a delight and a pleasure. All right, we did it. One more week in the books. The man, Joel himself, he's leading the way. Let's follow his example. Go to nosetail.org, order the meat, go to sapien.org, check out the program and the tribe. Check out the Food Lies film there as well. You can still pre-order a copy. Please share this with family and friends. Start back at episode one. Leave a review on the iTunes or podcast app. And come back next week for some more great interviews. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.